Hey everyone, it's uh, Fook, and uh, this is uh, part 2.5 of my retirement planning series. And I call it part 2.5 because I really didn't plan on making it, and it's a uh, follow-up to part 2. So uh, here I am. And it's uh, because I had a question that came in from a viewer that watched part 2. He knows who he is. And he asked me a really good question, which was uh, in relation to my advice about uh, cutting back on some of your automotive costs so that you can have uh, some money to start building your nest egg. And he basically asked me, you know, or he said that uh, I knew what my nominal, you know, cost was to make the decision that I made, but did I consider, you know, what would have happened in terms of opportunity costs if I took that difference and invested it in a savings account for retirement for, you know, X number of years, and what would have that meant? And that was a really good question. It's a really good way of looking at things. So I decided to dig into my records and see what I could find out. So um, in 1993, I graduated high school. And at the time, I was driving a 1978 Dodge Tradesman 200 uh, van. It was this brown van that everybody in school knew. And part of it was that we kind of needed for my family business a, a cargo van to haul shit around. So uh, that's what I drove in high school. And it served me well, but it's a van, doesn't get great with gas mileage, and wasn't really practical for going to university. So when I graduated high school, I uh, got accepted into a bunch of colleges, and one of them was the local uh, UC school, UC San Diego. And uh, I decided to go there. Um, and my parents, uh, bought me a brand new truck. It was a Ford Ranger V6 4x4, which is very nice of them. And part of the calculus there was that I was going to stay at home and commute to, to school, which a lot of students at UCSD did at the time, and I think they still do. It's a huge school. Um, so the rationale was that, yes, we're spending a lot on a new vehicle, um, but I'm not staying on campus, so we're going to save on room and board. So that was the thought. And, you know, it worked out, and I, I drove that car for, or that truck for almost 10 years before uh, it was total in an accident, not my fault. But um, in any case, uh, that's what we did. But by the time I started working in the school district, before I got what I call my real job, um, I was driving that thing and putting tons of miles on it. But as a pickup with a V6 engine, you know, I think I got like 16 or 17 miles to the gallon. It drives like a pickup. Uh, it was fun for taking off-road and whatnot, but to drive to work every day, to take these long trips to Los Angeles or whatever, um, wasn't really practical. So I've already decided when I started my real job in 2000, I was gonna get a sedan-type car. Uh, fast forward to 2001, and uh, I decided to pull, pull the trigger. And uh, that was when I got my first BMW. Um, it was a 1998 uh, 328iS, so silver coupe, two-door. It was a great car. Uh, drove awesome, a 2.6 inline V, you know, inline six, uh, not a V6, um, and I loved it. You know, and I remember the day that I bought it too. It was September 15, 2001, and what went through my head at the time was that this is four days after the 9/11 attack. And I was uh, thinking that this is a good time to buy the vehicle because I would be doing my part in kind of like helping out the economy and all that. There was a lot of you know, fear and whatnot going on at the time. And uh, two months after that, I bought my first house uh, in November of 2001. And on the house, I really don't regret. I, I built up a ton of equity in it, so that was great. But looking back at the car purchase, that was probably my first mistake uh, in getting a BMW in the first place. Um, but I was young, stupid, didn't learn my lesson. So three years later in 2004, February, I decided that, uh, you know, a two door coupe was sporty, nice and all that wasn't really practical. And, and a three series is, is kind of small. Um, so I decided to upgrade and of course I upgraded to another BMW and this time it was a 2540i. So four door sedan, black, uh, 4.0 V8 engine. Great car, probably the best uh, five series that BMW has ever made. Uh, it really was the ultimate driving machine, but that, that's really another video. Um, so that was mistake number two. 
Uh, but even in buying those two cars, I didn't buy them new. So that was great. You know, I bought a late model, three to four years old, let someone else take the depreciation hit. Um, but when I look back and I said, hmm, what did I pay for that three series? It was just a tad under 30,000. And I drove it for like, you know, two and a half, less than three years for sure, traded in and bought a $40,000 five series um, and got like, you know, a $14,000 credit or something like that. Um, I ended up financing maybe 26,000 after taxes and whatnot on the five series and trading in my three series. Uh, and the payment on that over five, five years with BMW Financial Services was like $475 a month. Um, totally could afford it, it wasn't a problem affording it. It was just, did I really need that car? Um, and clearly the answer is no. I mean, I really enjoyed it, but I didn't really need it. And in, in, in part two of my, my video series on planning for retirement, I had talked about how getting a less expensive car could save you money. And I alluded to a couple of things. One of them was this $800 handshake that um, people who don't own BMWs don't know, right? So looking at my record, uh, the average oil service was like 120 bucks to 130, depending on how many quarts of oil I needed and whatnot. Um, whereas with another vehicle like a Honda Accord or a Toyota Camry, or even the Lexuses, um, it could be like 40, 45 bucks for an oil change. And part of that was that there were some parts that were required um, as part of the recommended oil service on BMWs that made it more expensive. Um, so there was that. And then there's all the, these uh, kind of regular maintenance, um, like um, an inspection one that they had, I think it was like 45,000 miles or something like that, maybe it was 30. But you bring that in, it was almost $600, right, to get them to check a bunch of things and do what they needed to do. And then when you get near 90,000 miles, um, it calls for an inspection two, which was just under $1,000. And this wasn't even at the dealer, the inspection two was done at a third party service company that was highly recommended. Um, so that's some examples of the cost of owning that car. And I mentioned that because, you know, I didn't really appreciate what that meant compared to something like, you know, a Camry, which I drive now and, and love. Um, but yeah, it was just super expensive, you know, and I, I always do the recommended maintenance because I truly believe that if you do, it saves you a lot of money further down the road with other repairs and whatnot. So the other factor that goes into all of this, so you have the cost of the car, you got maintenance, there's also insurance costs. Um, at 26, when I got the three series, I was paying a ridiculous amount of money for that car in terms of insurance. And part of it was the class of vehicle as a two door coupe. It was classified as a sports car. And as a 26 year old male single, um, yeah, insurance was through the roof. When I got the five series later on, uh, I was older. It was a more expensive car, but it ended up being about the same cost only because it was in a different class. It was in a four door sedan class. So uh, yeah, insurance was still expensive. The other factor that goes into kind of the total cost of ownership is the vehicle registration fee, basically the road tax. Um, it's based in California on the value of your vehicle. So the more expensive the vehicle, the more expensive the road tax. And then there's the uh, gas costs too for a high performance car, right? BMW requires premium gasoline. And with a V8, you didn't get that great of a gas mileage. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. When I calculate the difference between, um, you know, what I'm driving now and that V8 in the five series over four years, it was like $2,500. And that was at an average of about 350 a gallon, which, you know, I think is about right. Um, so when you look at it all in, I, I probably spent at least $30,000 more than I should have on a very nice, decent car for commuting to work, um, by my calculation. Um, clearly, I didn't need to upgrade from the three series to the five series. And on top of that, I didn't need to buy a freaking BMW, right? Um, so when I look at it and I say, huh, what could I have done with that $30,000 difference? And mind you, that's conservative. Um, 
if I had put all of that into a retirement account and I wouldn't have gotten 40 years out of it because, you know, this was in my uh, mid 20s to uh, to late 20s. So conservatively, probably 35 years in a retirement account. And if I was calculating it based on an 8% annual return, which I think is completely doable and actually pretty conservative because on the long term, when you invest in the stock market and reinvest all your dividends, you're getting more like 9.5%, 9.6%. So in any case, 30 grand, 35 years at 8%, it turns out that that was almost $450,000. That was my number um, in terms of opportunity cost. Now, if you were making a decision that was only 10,000 or 5,000 or whatever it is, it's gonna be less. But in my example of what really happened to me and all the stupid decisions I made with cars, it was almost half a million dollars. Um, and that was really the cost. Um, and that, mean, that, that means a couple of things. Either it meant that I had to contribute more to, to have that nest egg that's half a million more by the time I retire, or I have to work longer uh, in order to have the money to contribute and build that up. So you're trading either money or, or time. And it's a, it's a big component, right? So either two or three years of extra work versus retirement, or just you know that huge sum that you can build up over 30, 35 years. Um, that's big. Now, you've heard me talk about these cars pretty passionately. And I, I like cars. I mean, I enjoyed it when I had it. Um, the reason I tell you this is that it's always useful to frame it in terms of the total opportunity cost, right? And if you knew going in that it was going to be a half million dollar decision and you still think like you deserve it, you should get it, more power to you. I'm not going to dissuade you from doing it. Uh, I, I just would advise that you go in with your eyes wide open on what that would actually cost you in the long run, rather than just looking at today's dollars. So for me, that was half a million. If I knew then and thought about it in these terms, I probably wouldn't have made some of those decisions. Uh, it's really tough, I know, you know, now, anyways. Uh, probably didn't know as much when I was younger. I mean, I was a smart guy, still I'm a smart guy, but there's something about youth that uh, make you do crazy, reckless things. But if you're watching these videos, uh, maybe it's just helping to reinforce that, you know, you just should think twice. But like I said, if you go through that exercise and still feel like, hey, I want to get the car, then by all means, get the car, enjoy it. Uh, but just realize how much it, it costs you. Anyways, at the, uh, on Saturday, I'm flying off to uh, the UK for work. So there won't be a part three this, this weekend, but um, there definitely will be a part three coming up, probably the weekend after that. But since I'll be in the UK, it'll probably be out of the UK instead of out of San Diego. Anyways, I hope you enjoy the follow-up to part two. Thank you for the question that was asked. Uh, I dug up some information and yeah, it was pretty eye-opening. Um, anyways, thanks for checking in and I'll see you next time. Bye.